Okay, today is February 3rd, and this is the 2015 Facilities Geospatial Technology Showcase. This six-month webinar series is hosted by the Campus Facilities Technology Association and organized by the University of Kentucky. I'm Lauren Weaver, and thank all of our attendees today for joining us. Today's webinar is being recorded. Both the recording and slides will be made available on the CFT website. Site. The presentation is estimated to run about 45 minutes with the remaining time dedicated to Q&A. Feel free to send any question during the presentation using the questions dialog box or by raising your hand. Your question will be added to the queue and answered as time allows at the end of the presentation. I'd like to extend a special thank you to today's presenter, Scott Stocking. Scott is joining us again and serves as the Spatial Data Interface Analyst at the University of Chicago's Facility Services. Today's presentation is about immersed 3D visualization of the University of Chicago's campus. The Spatial Data Interface program there has partnered with research labs to develop for now and the future. He will speak about how users may use 3D data of the virtual campus to evaluate planning and design proposals, engineering studies, and other spatially intensive activities. Scott, thank you for joining us today to share your experience. The webinar is yours. All right, thank you very much and welcome everybody. Um, we're going to spend a little time uh, this afternoon and chat about what we've been working on in the last year or so on our 3D visualization using spatial data um, in various formats and kind of walk you through how, we're, how we've worked on this project up to this point. And uh, we touched a little bit on it. Uh, if you attended my last talk on the spatial data infrastructure for the University of Chicago, where we talked a little bit about our visualization efforts. But in this presentation, we're going to dive in a little bit deeper, get into some of the details and lessons learned. So those of you who are looking to embark on this journey, to do 3D visualization, hopefully this will get some value and give you sort of a jump start on your work effort. So for our out discussion outline, we always like to start with the objectives of the project, why we undertook this effort. We'll get into some of the data that we utilize to build the, the model. And then into the methods and to build the model, we used a lot of different software because our data came from many different data sources. And then we'll get into... I'm going to interrupt you for a second. Your screen is black right now. I just wanted to make sure we shouldn't, we should be seeing something right now. Oh. I see your mouse moving around and the screen black. Uh, do you have the webinar screens on the same screen as your slides right now? There we go. Okay, we see it now. Okay. Great, okay. Sorry to interrupt. Please continue. That's good. I'm glad you did. <laughs> okay. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about the K2 uh, visualization environment, uh, which we teamed with the University of Illinois Chicago, uh, who has built this visualization environment, which is quite unique. And then we'll get into some of the tricks, lessons learned in this whole effort, and then have a general discussion on next steps and what we're planning on doing here in 2015. Okay, so for the objectives of the project, um, they're pretty straightforward. Uh, the primary thing was to create a 3D composite model of all our existing data sources. So as they brought me on to build the SDI for the university, it kind of felt like we needed to bring it together and kind of show what this visualization 3D model would look like, at least at some level. So that, uh, just so we'd be able to describe it and show it, I mean, you can, you can always talk about it and give you spec, but seeing is believing. So um, we undertook this effort just to, to kind of bring those, those environments together into one spot so we could share that with our leadership team and staff. Um, through this effort, we were going to identify some tools and methods that were necessary in order to build the model, obviously. So never really undertaken an effort like this, so it was a learning curve to get that. So this was a good shakeout to try to figure out uh, how best to, to kind of bring it all together. And then um, we decided to model it in an immersed visualization environment just because it is such a rigorous uh, environment. And um, 
it felt like if we could pull this off, then we would be good for screen displays and other other visualization environments. So we kind of took it uh, at the highest level possible to um, to really uh, put it in a rigorous environment and see how the model actually functioned. So for the objectives, um, again, the idea was to push it into the 3D environment, um, which was the most rigorous we could find. We were fortunate to, that UIC is just eight miles down the road, and they've built this laboratory to do immersed visualization. So that was a really good mix right there. Um, how this impact the environment was shows on tools and models. So that it's really, again, how that's going to all shake out. And we felt that um, we needed to start concentrating on where, what kind of platform we were going to use for the visualization environment. Do the existing Autodesk tools work? Do the Esri tools work? Those kinds of things. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and then the issues presented through this process obviously is going to address it in the final data model. So being able to deal with it in a city GML format, which is our data standard we've uh, set for the repository that um, um, we would take whatever comes out of this process and um, roll that into the model. And the reason why this is important is for the, the virtual campus model for the spatial data infrastructure, one of the key functions this model is going to provide is visualization. So we had to be certain that um, we had that base covered. I mean, there's a couple other things the central repository will do for the university. I think we mentioned it for those who didn't attend the SDI talk, um, things like a central catalog and doing some analytics and modeling using three-dimensional mo modeling data. Um, those are some of the other things the virtual campus will do as well. But obviously, we're we're looking at it to too big, be a heavy lifter in the visualization environment. So for the data that we utilized, um, this pretty much runs all the way across the board. Um, we had some GIS building uh, data, uh, road data. Um, we have uh, the city of Chicago building database, which we got through Cook County as well as some polygon data, building data that we just generated since I, I arrived. Um, we have a large um, I don't know what that was. Um, We had a, a, a BIM detailed building drawings, so we had some BIM models that we were utilizing as part of the modeling effort. Yes? Your, your screen is actually black again. Um, if you have any of the webinar windows or pullout windows on the same screen as the slides, that may be what's calling, causing it. There we go. Okay, we see it again. Sorry about that. <laughs> All right. Yeah, you're good uh, to go. Okay, I'll try to hide that. I mean, I think it's hidden. It's a sneaky little guy. Okay. Um, we had some building uh, SketchUp data that we also had out there for our exteriors for textures and photos, so we brought that into the environment. Um, for the methods, um, we utilize city uh, GIS City Engine uh, for the base model for roads and buildings. Um, so that was the, the biggest single chunk of data that we used to build the model. Um, we also used some CAD building footprints for our 3D CAD model. Um, again, we exported it out as FBX. Uh, we have a really large CAD repository of our building. Uh, most of all, every building on campus has a has a CAD floor plan repository as far as our um, building management system. Um, we had a couple of uh, rivet models that had come in on some of the new construction. Um, we also used that um, as an FBX export in the 3ds Max to help stage the environment. And then, as I mentioned, the SketchUp uh, data, which we basically pushed into City Engine using Culata tool sets. 
Um, so that, that was another piece that we were able to bring in some of those uh, visualization textures that came over from a separate model. And then finally we used uh, Unity uh, 3D gaming software to build the final model. And we'll talk to you a little bit about how that evolved. And we didn't start out with that idea, but fortunately we found the software and it turned out to be a pretty good fit for at least what we're trying to do right now. So for the methods on GIS City Engine, this is a screenshot of the base model and it's called Base 22 and that's right, there's 22 iterations of this model. So we felt like it was good enough to move it off into um, into the overall virtual campus environment. Um, we had the SketchUp data is already basically draped over the polygons that were generated and extruded in, in City Engine. We also dropped a, uh, a BIM model in this corner over here. We, we experimented quite a bit with what we could do with City Engine. Um, the roads came over as part of our road layer lines and so on. So we basically created this model through our various GIS geodatabases and then we dropped in over here in this this scene uh, window if you've used City Engine in the past uh, the various building culotta models were basically placed in there and loaded in the model and managed through the through City Engine. When we staged this uh, base 22 model we basically then exported it out FBX to uh, migrate it off into uh, into the uh, overall virtual campus model. Uh, we use 3ds Max uh, Autodesk, which is sort of their building visualization, 3D modeling, fly-through technology. If you've ever used it, you see in the upper left corner is sort of the Base 22 uh, campus model, and then we basically drop the new hospital pavilion into it uh, as part of a BIM modeling process. Um, at some point, we were going to use uh, 3ds Max as the staging area because it does have a lot of nice tools um, and it allows a lot of FBX importing from different sources but we found it to be too unruly and difficult to use in an interactive environment so we kind of uh, had to jettison it uh, after trying to make it work and it just was clear that it was not going to scale to a campus-wide environment. Um, for the methods, just to try a short summary of what we found through over the course of the year is what I call the good, bad, and the ugly. Um, the good is that 3ds Max is a good staging environment for FBX and bringing BIM models in. And also things from City Engine uh, for the Base 22 model. Um, so it was good uh, to deal with it in that level. Uh, one thing you notice is that as we ex uh, export out FBX from um, 3D CAD models or Revit or City Engine, all FBX file formats are not exactly the same. Uh, so you have that uh, that complexity going for it's just either different versions. We tried to control it to the extent we could with other Autodesk import export tools, but we could never get any kind of standardization. So we basically had to bring everything into FBX, stage it, and export it out out of 3ds Max, so we got a standard look and feel export of the XBX model into Unity. Um, and Unity is easy, relatively easy to use uh, for advanced visualization tools. It's an open source uh, program. Um, it was relatively quick to uh, figure out how to get in there and model it, and we'll kind of walk through it a little bit uh, in the presentation here. Um, the bad, as I mentioned, the 3ds Max is very tough to use in large models. I mean, just pure navigation with large numbers of polygons and multiple uh, import utilities was just, it just very cumbersome to use, tough to work around. Um, as I mentioned, the software support for import exports, we were getting a lot of variability, so um, that was also a problem. Um, we couldn't use uh, City Engine. As a, as a possible staging environment uh, or even hosting environment for the, for the model because it doesn't allow FBX imports. So that's a big, um, hopefully that can get resolved in a later date, but as it stands right now, you can export out of City Engine, but FBX cannot import. Um, and then the really ugly is texture mapping is an art uh, and the spatial placement 
of the model to the manual process. I mean, we, we struggled a lot with trying to get the best possible texture export, both on the SketchUp data out of City Engine as well as the FBX export out of uh, Rivet and into 3ds Max. And um, we got better. We got it, say, maybe 80%, maybe 90% in some cases to map correctly. It's just a very tough thing. Uh, the geometry and the meshing and the, um, the graphic files uh, linking in there. Sometimes it'll clip and not catch. And um, it's, just a, it's a, just a very cumbersome process. Uh, and hopefully that will go away here in a little bit. We'll talk about that towards the end of the project. So for the Unity 3D uh, alien environment, again, it, it was nice because it can handle extremely large imported models in FBX format. Um, it has very strong editing tools, much easier to navigate, edit, delete, you know, your typical editing management process. Uh, much easier to use as opposed to 3ds Max or even City Engine. And the other really nice thing about it is it is actually used in advanced visualization environments. So people have used this and pushed it into uh, as a as a hosting environment for visualization tool sets. So we didn't really know that, and uh, when we first started, we basically uh, were struggling making 3ds Max work. Uh, as a staging platform, as a visualization platform, and uh, we talked to our resource resource computing people here on campus, uh, and they said, you know, you need to look at video tools. It's really video gaming tools are really the only thing that could do what I was trying to do. So we started looking in that area, and this is what we wound up using. Um, here's an example of us dropping a BIM model into the overall. Um, virtual campus environment in, uh, in Unity. Um, it's tricky. We didn't start out at the beginning of the process and with a rigorous uh, environment and a lot of the information was in an state plane anyway, so we didn't have it in a, in, a, in a coherent spatial modeling framework where it was just basically things would drop in in the right location. So certainly the BIM models were not in state plane. Um, so we, we basically had to place them in, internally within the model. Difficult to do. Of course, it's a full 3D model. So as you can see, we've got the support shafts of the building underground, uh, below grade. Um, there's some grid tools in Unity to get you at a grade level and so forth. So it was kind of uh, walking through it <clears throat> and placing the models, uh, the BIM models within this framework. This is an example within Unity itself of a BIM model. The area over here on the left is the detailed objects that come over as part of the BIM model. So all these interior walls are all listed out. Um, the bottom part portion here are the various uh, FBX import models that we dropped in. So as you see here is base 22. It's probably pretty hard to see maybe on the screen, but um, the CCCD, so that's our new uh, hospital pavilion. These individual models were dropped in and then manipulated within the interface. So there's a lot of objects in each one of these things. I mean, on Base 22 alone had, you know, probably close to a million objects. Um, so there's, uh, you can get to each one of them uh, through, this, through this interface. Um, as I mentioned, when we brought the data in directly from their sources, uh, the textures didn't map. In some cases, we had gaps and things that didn't come over. So here's an example of one of our um, buildings in the central quad, one of our Gothic buildings. Uh, this came over as a SketchUp model. Um, some of the textures came over for the stone work. You know, the photog photography placement for some of the windows and door details came over. Um, so this is just one object. We select the roof tile here that's highlighted. This is the part of the object model. It exposes the controls over here for the mesh and, and putting a texture on it, which is this last part that's called the shader part. Um, so in areas that weren't uh, available, we had to go in and basically manually edit and fill in the gaps, if you will. Um, we do that through a library of tools, of graphic tools down here at the bottom. And uh, we had some 2,000 uh, objects in the, in the library. Um, 
and that's a pretty small number right now. It's only um, uh, four detailed BIM models and whatever came over on SketchUp. So we just kind of scratched the surface on that. That model is going to get quite a bit bigger on the textures. Um, and this is just an example of some of the pi uh, templates that came over of the objects. Um, and Unity does a good job in managing these things and putting them into, into a library repository and being able to go in and, and map them out to uh, the actual spatial objects within the model. So with the virtual campus specifications, um, the model as it sits right now is a little over 2 million objects. As I mentioned, there's 2,000 texture files, which are just the graphics and images that came over from the importing process. It's coming over from a BIM model in FBX that's using the Autodesk uh, materials library standards. Uh, the uh, graphic files are basically just JPEGs that come over from the SketchUp. Um, the overall total model size is around 2.5 GB. Again, as mentioned, it's only a small model. We only have four buildings that are actually uh, modeled uh, both interior and exterior within this uh, within the virtual campus. So what we did is we um, we were we toured the UIC uh, electronic visualization lab uh, about a year or so ago and found their technology very intriguing. They built this in this room that. Um, um, is used uh, for immersed visualization. So I mean by immersed is basically you're projected into the model itself. Um, so you're basically totally surrounded by the environment. You feel like you're standing in the middle of the model and you basically are through the visualization uh, process within the cave. It's an extremely high resolution stereoscopic environment. So um, as you um, navigate through the through the objects. You feel like you're, you know, the walls are right there, the windows are there, so on. Um, and uh, they have a different ways of navigating. You do it through the glasses and walk through the room and navigate that way. Or if you're doing it from a large fly through into the interiors, you can do it through a a drive stick. There's just two different ways to sort of navigate through the space. And here's just some shots of. Um, standing in the room and looking at the screen display in front. Um, so this is the model is placed uh, within the cave. Um, you can see the the textures that came over for the models uh, that we actually had texture information. Some of the just general shapes and things that are just polygons, extruders, or GIS coverage uh, polygons, buildings, uh, and then some other that we had some detailed. Uh, information that came over um, but didn't map textures wise or we hadn't been able to go in and edit all the various things. So a good example of that would be the library here right in front where we see that some of the textures have come over and some have not. Um, another shot um, looking down um, one of the roads to the main campus. We had BIM models of different um, resolution. This model right here in the very middle with the tower didn't come over with any texture information. It's an interior-exterior model, but just a surface model. Um, this model right in the foreground here has textures, very detailed textures, uh, library that came over from the Autodesk file, Rivet. Um, and then we spent a great deal of time going in there and basically making sure all the surfaces mapped into a texture format. Here's an example, a uh, little bit uh, almost at grade, kind of looking at the model. This one on large model and thing is the BIM model that I showed on the other photograph that just didn't have any texture information. This is a SketchUp model of the building in the foreground. Um, so we've just basically it's just a compilation of all the data that we have in place right now. <clears throat> this is kind of approaching the building, uh, detailed BIM building that we have on sort of a grade. So you're basically walking down the street. You see the, the buildings on this side. Uh, see the detail of the buildings. You walk through the sidewalk through the front door. You enter inside the building. It's all seamless. Um, this is a really nice feature with the windows looking out over into the rest of the model. So this is the actual model exposed through these windows. 
Um, so that's a very nice feature, obviously, if you're doing visualization and evaluation. It's kind of turning a corner. If you were kind of looking over to the other side of the room, you can see here where some of the textures mapped and some did not. Um, but you can see through the windows and over to the other side of the campus and so on. So it's all good if you wanted to see what uh, is visible at certain parts of the building through windows and so forth. Uh, you can obviously do that in this model. And there's some examples of just some photography that came over from SketchUp uh, exposed in the cave. Um, so we're just experimenting. We're seeing what's possible, what works well, what doesn't work well. So for overall tricks, uh, things that we were trying to do, um, level of detail for textures is a big deal. Um, uh, we have to turn them on and off at large scales. Um, obviously, we didn't have that set up for an FBX model that's just coming over in with um, a set object model. Um, there's some things you can do in the cave for visualization to expose models. Basically, the cave is just trying to expose and project each object as it's encountered through its various perspectives as you're navigating. So it's basically live uh, rendering and, and management of two, two million objects. That's a lot. Um, uh, so what we tried to do is uh, break it down a little bit and try to deal with interior polygons and textures. Um, so we created our own LED. Um, so we had to break up the BIM model so we have an exterior form of the model and then the interior polygons. and then you can basically load it at runtime as you approach the building, suddenly the interior polygons come on. And another little trick we found is this, uh, the center of the model origin is very important. Uh, uh, we, didn't re we weren't really rigorous in this uh, modeling effort. We just basically turned it on and started, load started with base 22 and started loading things in. So we weren't, uh, too, we weren't expecting this model to have a life afterwards. So, but uh, obviously uh, our, our origin was set at an arbitrary point and uh, basically sat in Bloomington, Illinois, which is quite a bit farther than where the campus uh, center point is. Uh, so uh, we had to do some tricks and reset the origin. And then there were some things that the UIC folks, the computer scientists at the cave, could also do to help deal with that. It just, it just adds a lot of complexity in terms of loading and moving objects within the origin because of it's basically an arbitrary origin point that doesn't know where to insert the ob new objects as they come into the model. Um, lessons learned in the data models. Uh, as I mentioned, the LOD and map scaling issue. So, um, and that's a big deal. Um, just trying to manage it and bringing on polygons when needed at certain levels of visualization. And that's good because that uh, flows right into uh, some of the things that City GML can do for us. As I mentioned, the textures don't really map consistently within BIM and SketchUp. There may be some secret methods to do that or folks that have more experience at it. I'm sure you can get better, but I don't think you're ever going to get a one-to-one -one match. Um, I've also been talking to other people who have been doing this, and maybe 3D CAD exports might work better than FBX, but we haven't really experimented with that at all. Um, the geometric conversions are tough on FBX, uh, but um, FBX seems to be the most common supported uh, format, although it does alter some of the geometry, uh, the solid geometry. Not greatly, but it does alter a little bit. Um, and that obviously complex, uh, makes the complexity with the meshes a little bit harder. Um, and then, of course, how much attribution do we carry forward and semantics? Um, you know, we're going to try to keep it lean and mean so we don't have a whole lot of uh, attribution to carry forward as part of the process. Um, but we also want the visualization environment uh, to work seamlessly within the catalog and the whole smart cities, open web services, modeling, analytics environment. In other words, we don't want to create an environment that's sort of for visualization only and it's stripped down and managed for that process, and then there's another one for catalog, and then another one for the modeling effort for analytics. You kind of want all those to work together, and obviously um, the level of attribution necessary to describe those objects and 
be um, useful in those other two environments is something we have to continue to work on. Um, on the software side, uh, it's not really ready for prime time. I mean, the video game software can, really can't scale to the level of detail or complexity uh, we need to present. Um, I mean, the video games look like they're extremely high resolution imagery, but it's actually quite simplified. Um, uh, they're getting better. I mean, some of the Maya, we worked with Maya a little bit, bit in Blender, and they seem to work. They had a little bit better utilities and things. Uh, they're 64-bit software, which helps a lot. I mean, Unity has a 32-bit limit. So um, that, that's, a, that's an impediment. Uh, we basically have hit the threshold on Unity. We can't go any further with the size of the model until they upgrade to 64-bit. Um, management tools, obviously, I've mentioned before, pretty hard. And then the whole idea of um, the building versus campus level visualization. So um, we built a, a request or the signage for the medical center on campus for putting a new uh, lighted sign on top of the hospital pavilion. Um, you know, we tried to do that in Unity. It was just too difficult to deal with. It. And so we went back to 3DS Max at the building level and scaled this uh, new sign onto the building and, and did some visualization tools, sort of walk through fly throughs with it. Um, you know, down the street and through a corridor and so forth to kind of visualize the sign. Um, so there's probably some going forward, there might be some need to have some BIM set um, visualization tools, either in 3DX or Revit can also do fly-throughs. Um, when you're doing with a building-centric model where you're really interested in that, and then maybe more of a virtual campus model that's, uh, that runs into the, but, um, that's something we're, we'll continue to explore. Um, hardware is really good, uh, getting better. I mean, my workstation is pretty beefy. It's not exactly enormous, but it it, uh, it really didn't have any issues with it um, in handling pretty large data sets. Um, in general, I think 64-bit environments probably will work OK uh, until we get to really large scale. Uh, detailed three-dimensional modeling, um, then we might need to go scale into a course um, virtual environment um, where we can go in and get some additional computing resources. Um, the Cave 2 technology so far, um, the throughput's been fine. We don't get any flicker or resolution efforts. We had to do some tweaking and so forth. So as long as we keep the overall display uh, manageable, um, you know, the two million uh, polygons, it seems to be working just fine. Uh, as again, as we scale up, there might be some uh, upgrades that are necessary to keep up. But, but as it stands right now, uh, the actual hardware, display hardware in the immersed environment can, can handle what we're trying to do. <clears throat> so for next steps, um, we need to determine what the visualization software is going to be. As I mentioned, Unity sits at a 32-bit program. It needs to get at least the 64. Maybe we use Maya or Bender or some other tools that uh, that UIC uses that are based on open scene graph technology. Um, so we'll continue to explore some of those things. Um, build the virtual campus in CityGML. We started doing that right now. So actually, you know, migrating what we've done under this effort and and trying to get into the actual model into the next uh, generation. We'd also um, that some nice things with City GML, as I mentioned, is it deals with the level of detail uh, abstraction. So that's just out of the box as part of the modeling process, and that'll help a great deal in trying to get it into uh, an advanced visualization environment in terms of when you actually turn on and display uh, surfaces and objects. Um, we're also looking at putting in other caps, cap, campus assets into the model utilities. We've done some base. Uh, Prototyping of this is an example of a steam tunnel and condensate network going through a vault, underground vault. Um, so doing some of the underground and uh, bringing that into the environment. We've done prototype testing and it, it works fine. It, it follows with the rest of the model so far, but um, we'd like to actually put it into the uh, into the immersed environment. Um, and then texture management I mentioned, uh, but maybe that'll go away, and we'll get to that here in a little bit. 
and then creating a plug and play model components for building utilities. Um, when we first started this effort, we did not see the virtual campus model, at least the first generation, having a life would basically just be used for prototyping and a learning tool, but uh, now there's some demand and maybe we want to use this environment going forward. So we might have to do a little more rigor in there and try and figure out how to make it work as a plug and play model. So for the next steps on the second generation model, um, prototype one, we're doing a detailed BIM uh, model export of a design model uh, with Mortensen Construction, who's our general contractor on the North Dormitory project. Um, so we're going to determine the level of texture mapping we can get out of that and how we can place that into the virtual campus for design evaluation. So um, we're probably up in the, uh, the overall detail on the BIB model quite a bit to, to the, the extent that we can, trying to bring over all the objects. Um, and this is actually just the last week we've just started dropping it in. Good news is the initial model dropped in fairly well. It actually sits right here on campus. Um, it's a series of uh, dormitory towers. They also have some um, uh, civil site uh, information, basements, and so on. So we're basically trying to, that's just first fit out of the box. Um, and now we're going to start loading in some more detailed level information. So they got things like exterior skin, um, precast concrete, all the interior objects. Uh, you know, taking the construction design models and bringing all that detail into one. And then the second generation model for the Euclidean technology evaluation. So there's this, uh, we've just uh, gotten an agreement working with Euclidean on their unlimited detailed format for their point clouds. So basically they've developed a technology that can use point clouds at full resolution um, out of the box on a basic PC. Um, we're going to test it. We're going to see if that is, in fact, the case and will work well with our environment. And if it does, then we will do most of our visualization uh, using the clouds and that, that take a huge part of the problem out of the picture in terms of trying to map textures into surfaces. Um, so we'll be, we're in the process of testing it now. We've just got the software and we're starting to use our existing point clouds and we'll hopefully in the next few months be able to determine if this technology has some, some life in this effort. <clears throat> and then we'll roll it all into uh, developing prototypes. Um, and then if there's a mixture of visualization geometric modeling within the cave, so in some cases we might still need surface modeling, uh, actual geometry, and then the point clouds and how that would actually fit and mix uh, and then the different management uh, requirements for that um, could be quite uh, interesting to make that all into one useful uh, model that relates to one another. And then as we um, determine all these things, then we'll adjust the, the spatial data infrastructure program plan and our work program and what we need to do on it. So that was a pretty quick, uh, fast review. Um, again, I think. Hopefully we'll get some of this, or most of this work done by 2015 and uh, being able to figure out what we are going to do in terms of building the final virtual campus. And that's my presentation. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Great. Well, thank you. Uh, thanks for squeezing so much in as far as so many aspects of your research and the applications of these technologies. Uh, I appreciate it, particularly the snippets you shared. Those are certainly impressive. You can tell you put a lot into the attention of detail in those models. Um, so thank you for sharing all of that. Uh, at this time, I'd like to move into the Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have any questions not yet submitted, feel free to go ahead and send using the questions dialog box or by raising the hand icon. And then I'll add your questions to the queue. First, I have a couple of questions from Sean Joyner. To what degree are the BIM models complete? I know you talked a little bit about using different levels for different purposes, but what level have you completed them to? Level 100, 200, 300, et cetera? Yeah, that's a good question. I think most of the um, modeling, at least the initial modeling that we've worked on, was um, probably just a little more than 100, might be an almost 200 level. 
we're now moving into 300 level. So as I mentioned, that's sort of what we're doing in this second uh, generation prototype with Mortensen. So we're taking their design model and some of the more detailed stuff that comes over in the construction modeling process and trying to expose all those objects. Okay. And I'm curious, how much work is involved in upgrading the current levels you have to the next level? For those of us that are looking to go into BIM modeling, is it pretty extensive? Um, well, we don't actually generate any of our own BIM data. Uh, we all do it through um, consultants and through contracts. So the only data that we would, um, we would consume would be coming from the private side, uh, from general contractors or, or from architects. So, okay. yeah, we're creating a set of BIM standards to, as far as cost is concerned for harvesting it, to push it into the SDI, we're creating a, as part of our BIM standards process, we'll create a series of templates to extract that spatial data out of the core BIM model uh, into a format that we can easily transpose into our environment. That's, that's great, that's great. And another one from Sean, he's curious about the application of the software as far as designing and planning. He mentions U of Chicago has a beautiful campus. Have you guys thought at all about using it to model landscape or had any interest in that yet? Yeah, I think we showed, um, if you looked really close at one of the zoom-ins that we did for the Quad Club, which was a detailed BIM modeling, there was a civil site model attached to that. That's the first time we actually tried to drop in some topography and some landscape elements. And it worked pretty well. Um, I think, yes, uh, eventually we do have all of our trees, our major trees surveyed as a GIS layer some other uh, information, grounds information that is in the GS, and as those things develop, we'll f try to find ways to bring it in and make it a more realistic uh, environment. Okay, thank you. I have a question from, from Parvane Kosari. Uh, what support did you have in this development? Did you have, and you already mentioned, of course, having consultants. What degree was done in-house? Did you have support of students or full-time employees? It's all done in-house. Um, data development is done by some of the interns, but we all did it. We did it all in-house as far as using the tools and um, bringing in the models and exporting them out. Uh, we've got a great collaboration with the UIC staff um, on the Cave 2, so they fortunately use Unity as one of their uh, softwares that they use for uh, display in the Cave. Uh, and they were very helpful in um, testing some of our exports and validating how things were working and what needed to be fixed. And so, yeah, was, that's the main collaboration. But we did it all in-house. Uh, we just we just used existing data products that came over as contracts and uh, just tried to use them, put them all in one environment. Okay. Okay. There's a question from Tom McGaffrey. How do you deal with subsurface terrain and building elevations? For example, maybe a walkout ba basement at your house. <laughs> that is something we're now trying to deal with. We did not run it. The model doesn't sit on a DEM or any kind of um, uh, surface model. Um, we just didn't feel like we needed to tackle that. We're basically flat anyway. We're, we have very few hills. Um, so we didn't try to add that complexity. We're doing that now with the city GML model with some export tools to create a surface terrain using our DEM model. We have one foot interval uh, data that we've created a DEM out of. And now we're doing the merging of the buildings to that frame. That's not a trivial problem. Um, but we've got working with a tool uh, group out of Italy that uh, has built some tool sets that can do extrusion out of a DEM and uh, LIDAR data for uh, initial geometry. So um, we're just starting prototyping that. But that is something that um, is going to add a little bit of extra complexity to the model. Sounds juicy. I'm interested to see what the Italian company comes up with as far as extrusion goes. I'm sure a lot of us here are. Okay, I have a question from Andy Porter. 
How about adding exterior or non-building information? I think you already answered this to some extent, but is there anything you might want to add to that? Um, <clears throat> I mean, basically, yeah, we're going to, we're going to get better at it. Um, I think, again, we were just using the modeling tools as presented to us by our contractors. So, um, and they supplied it any way they saw fit. And I think I showed a BIM model that didn't have any texture information. And then we had another BIM model. They spent a lot of time and effort on the texture information. Um, so as part of the BIM specs, we'll come in with something definitive in terms of level of detail and what, what we expect on the textures. Um, and, and try to map that in. I think um, I'm kind of hoping the whole texture side of things go away with the point clouds. Um, I don't think we'll ever get to a solution that's going to be completely out of the box and it'll just work fine. Um, <laughs> there's just too many objects and the geometry is too complex. And again, it's just sort of a meshing of a geometric model to a standard graphic or um, uh, texture file and it, it sometimes just do the complex geometry it's not going to map correctly hopefully I do, <laughs> do you have any this is maybe a more challenging question but do you have any ideas for a, an option away from using textures and merging that with the spatial information yeah I think again we're going to try to use the point clouds I mean if we can if we can use the point clouds at full resolution um, that will provide photographic quality spatial modeling. Um, and at that point, then it would just be whether we needed to expose geometry um, for other purposes, um, mostly on analytic modeling. Um, there may be square footages and other things we'll do for like space optimization and building management and things. So, or maybe some reasons to keep some of that stuff, or we may just decide it's too difficult to do. We'll just let our people do that in systems of record and just keep that part of outside the process. So I don't know how that's actually going to all land. I just I just know under the current state of the art that um, it doesn't work real well right now. Okay. Thank you for sharing that insight. Um, have one more question from Andy. Uh, he's curious about how you who you see as clients and users, and clearly you have a lot of potential users on the campus. But can you identify more so who those specific parties might be? Well, the facilities group will use it extensively um, for a whole wide range of things in operations. So obviously, the planning and design people can use it for design evaluations. Um, plan alternatives, uh, we can work directly with the administration on, on new buildings and grounds and try to give them a look for how a much better look and how it's going to actually uh, be, be, you know, look like before it's actually built and that's, that's one thing. Uh, facilities folks, I think uh, being able to, for like equipment placement and things like that, to be able to take measurements and be able to see the environments and be able to do best fits and things for like uh, equipment rehabs and other things um, or just finding where things are that need to be maintained and stuff. So um, if it's realistic visual environment, I think they can navigate to it and then get to their back end tools based on that. They don't necessarily have to be on site. So internally that uh, that kind of, and externally I think there's a huge, there's un, almost unlimited uh, Obviously, we'll send them out as packets, uh, design packets to uh, folks that uh, be hired for new building design and construction um, with the notion that we'll evaluate their design as a part of the modeling process. <coughs> um, and then the whole environmental modeling and analytics side of things and having a working three-dimensional model, uh, we basically can do a whole bunch of things. Uh, uh, with that uh, information and or using other tools to plug into it. So um, it's sort of just, uh, there won't, hopefully there won't be a limit, uh, limitation on that um, because the spatial side of things has been, been handled. So now it's just um, sensors or, or other uh, resolution of the data that you've got to, to mesh in uh, with their existing 3D model. 
Okay. And I may have missed, missed this during the presentation, so I apologize if that is the case, but I'm curious as to whether you've been able to link your spatial information with information, for example, about buildings for generating work orders and use in the facility's capacity in that way. We haven't done it up to this point. Um, there, there hasn't been a big cry to do it um, at, at this point. Um, I think we, 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 we will do it at some point. Um, the question will be whether we do it in a system of record or we do it in a virtual campus model. Um, because there's some existing tools. We use Maximo right now in our asset management. There's existing tools that and Navis works uh, built right into Maximo so that you can basically expose the BIM models uh, right directly in Maximo. So it might not be worth doing it, but some of the other grounds information doesn't sit in a BIM model. So um, that would be in it probably in GIS, in some cases CAD. So um, in that case, we might um, do it in a GIS format, potentially, or, you know, actually see whether we want to do it in, a, in the virtual campus. Okay. Okay. Uh, Eric Witter also had a question uh, that was asked a few minutes ago. So you've already talked a little bit about the application of this and facilities planning, but is there are there any intentions to use this as wayfinding, for example? Yes, um, <clears throat> wayfinding is something that we've kind of looked at um, at some level. Um, it's the medical center is very interested in it, uh, with people trying, uh, visitors trying to navigate the, that large facility. Uh, so there's multiple hospitals and multiple labs and things that people visit, and it's very difficult right now to get it in there. It would be a benefit in a three-dimensional model. Um, it, the virtual campus could be used for that, as you, but as you well know, there's other things involved in wayfinding that aren't readily apparent in the model. So things like restricted access, wheelchairs, you know, whether you go upstairs. Um, so um, we would have to, none of that stuff's mapped right now. So all that information would have to be certainly uh, pushed in um, and included in the model. Um, but yeah, I mean, once we have a 3D model, at least we could give them a three-dimensional wayfinding prospect, but there's still a lot of things uh, that we just haven't mapped <clears throat> that that impact your ability to navigate. Okay. I know that the efforts involved in mapping all of those features can be quite extensive. Certainly eye candy, though. Good to think about. <laughs> okay. Well, um, if you would like to say anything else, please go ahead. Otherwise, I think we'll wrap up the Q&A section of this webinar. Yeah, I just hope everybody enjoyed it. And if you have any other questions, uh, certainly feel free to reach out to me. Great. Okay. Well, thank you to all of our attendees joining us today. You can access the recording and slides from the CFTA website following this webinar. If we weren't able to answer your question directly or if you have any additional questions, please feel free to contact Scott and you can see his contact information is on the screen right now. The next webinar in the Geotech Showcase is scheduled for 1 p.m. Eastern Time on February 19th. Brad Ball, GIS Team Lead and Developer at NASA Langley Research Center, will present LARC's Portal-Based Spatial Data Management and Decision Support Environment. For more information on future webinars in this series and more, visit the CFTA website at www.cfta.org.